Hello, Dana Sparks, broker of Maximum One Greater Atlanta Realtors. And this week's contract tip has to do with counter offers. So remember, an, a buyer is going to make an offer on a purchase and sale agreement. And then if the seller and the buyer counter any of the terms back and forth, that really should be done on a counter offer form. So on the counter offer form, the only terms that should be on there is anything that the other party, let's start with the buyer. Let's say the buyer writes an offer on a purchase and sale agreement. Let's say the seller agrees to everything except for uh, purchase price, closing costs, and leaving the washer and dryer. So the seller is going to prepare a counter offer form and send just those three changes, purchase price, closing costs, and uh, the personal property item of uh, washer and dryer. Sign it, send it back to the buyer. Let's say the buyer is fine with not uh, with the seller taking the washer and dryer and they are fine with the purchase price, but they need more money in closing costs. So the buyer is then going to prepare counter offer number two and send it back to the seller. Now, because the buyer is accepting the fact that the washer and dryer are not staying with the property and that's different from the original offer, that needs to be carried over into counter offer number two. Then let's say the seller um, agrees to all of that, then the seller signs it and then you have a binding contract. So my point is two things. Uh, my point is that you only have one signed counter offer. The successive counter offers that go back and forth between the parties are not included in the contract. None of those are signed. None of that is included. So any terms that are agreed upon that are different from the original purchase and sale, but are agreed upon in the countering negotiations, those agreed upon items different from the purchase and sale need to be carried through in each successive counter. All you're going to get for the binding terms of the agreement is the final signed counter offer, which will be the only form signed by the buyer and the seller, and the original purchase and sale agreement. Those successive counters in between do not count. So if any of the agreed upon terms are not included in that final counter offer, and they're different from the original purchase and sale, they are not going to be included in the final deal. Now, signatures. The buyer obviously will have signed the original purchase and sale agreement because they made the offer. And both parties will have signed the final agreed upon counter offer. The seller does not go back and sign the original purchase and sale agreement. And here is why. The counter offer forms all reference a purchase and sale agreement. So if you have a binding contract, you have two party signatures, on a counteroffer form, it references a purchase and sale agreement, so a third party person, i.e. a judge, knows to go back and look for another document that is being referenced. If both parties sign the actual original purchase and sale agreement and have a signed counteroffer, which is the actual terms. You have a signed purchase and sale agreement that nowhere references a counter offer. So technically that could be interpreted as the binding terms between the contract and could hold up in court should there be an issue. Um, now there are many lenders that are going to require a seller to go back and sign any financing contingency exhibits if those are additional exhibits. As long as those were not countered in the countering process, then you know, it, it's okay for a seller to go back and sign those financing contingency forms. If any of those terms were countered in the countering process, my suggestion would be go ahead and execute a conformed copy with new uh, financing exhibits so that the lender can see that. Now, if you do execute a conformed copy, which we colloquially, colloquially, not sure about the pronunciation. Think of that as a clean copy. Make sure you include the special stipulation that this is a conformed copy, and if there are any discrepancies between this copy and the original terms of the binding agreement, the terms of the binding agreement shall prevail. That verbiage is provided for you in the GAR contract special stipulation forms, and we have provided it for you in these contract tips. So I hope that helps. Um, just remember two things. Any successive 
terms countered that are agreed upon that are different from the original purchase and sale agreement need to be carried through to the final binding agreement and the any any terms i didn't mention this earlier but any terms from the original purchase and sale that are agreed upon between the parties do not need to be addressed in the counter offer form if the buyer and the seller agree on sale price and they're countering some of the other terms you don't need to reference the sale price in each successive counter offer form because that's already agreed upon so i hope this helps again dana sparks broker of maximum one greater atlanta realtors satisfying your needs with service innovation, and education.